In this next lecture, we're going to talk about the different types of leukemia that might be tested on step one, as well as the various types of myeloproliferative disorders that you might see on test day. So to begin, let's remind ourselves that the definition of a leukemia is a lymphoid neoplasm originating in the bone marrow that results in circulation of malignant lymphoid cells throughout the bloodstream. Now that's different than lymphoma, which usually happens as a discrete tumor mass arising from a lymph node. So that's the main distinction between the two. Now there are several types of leukemia you should be familiar with for step one. The first of these is ALL, or acute lymphoblastic leukemia. As the name implies, this is a malignancy that involves a very, very large number of lymphoblasts. These lymphoblasts will actually take over the bone marrow, and so you have a population of immature, basically immature lymphocytes overpopulating the bone marrow and replacing other crucial fragments. So you might see platelets getting quite low in these patients, so a thrombocytopenia. You might also see them become anemic because of a lack of red blood cell production in the bone marrow. Now, there's an important cell marker that tells you that these B cells and T cells that make up the lymphoblastic lymphoma are immature. And that cell marker is TDT, terminal deoxynucleotidal transferase. And TDT is a marker that's only present on immature T cells and B cells. So if you take a biopsy of bone marrow from these patients and you have a ton of lymphoblasts in the bone marrow, and you check them for TDT and they're positive, you're dealing with ALL. Now, one other important cell surface marker of this cancer is called CALLA, or CALA. And CALA stands for Common Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia Antigen. Common Acute Lymphoblastic Leukemia Antigen, CALLA. And this is not positive in all ALLs, but when it is positive, it's important because it actually pretends a better prognosis if you have CALA positive, a better prognosis. Now, ALL is actually quite responsive to chemotherapy, and for that reason, most of the children who come down with ALL, and it is mostly a disease of childhood, do quite well if it's recognized promptly and chemotherapy is started. Now, the other important test that we usually do on these patients to help us figure out their prognosis is to check for a chromosomal translocation between chromosomes 12 and 21. It's easy to remember because those two numbers are sort of the inverse of each other, right? So 12 is 1, 2, 21 is 2, 1. So it's easy for me to remember 12, 21, the chromosomal translocation that pretends a better prognosis in a patient with ALL. The next cancer we're going to talk about is called chronic lymphocytic leukemia, CLL. Now, ALL was more prominent in children, and CLL is actually much more common in older adults, generally greater than 60 years old. Now, these patients can have CLL for many years and be completely asymptomatic. So it's sort of one of these indolent cancers that takes a lot of time to get going. And the way that you usually diagnose it, you see the presence of what are called smudge cells on the peripheral blood smear. You take a blood sample and check for the different lymphoblasts and lymphocytes that are circulating in the bloodstream. And you actually might see lymphocytes that appear sort of smudged. Their borders are a little bit blurry. They look like they were smashed down. And you see these smudge cells you're thinking about CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Now, there are a couple associated conditions that you might see in a patient with CLL that are clues to the diagnosis. One is obviously going to be a lymphocytosis. So these patients may present with an increase in their lymphocyte count. That's one obvious one. One less obvious one is that these patients can actually get hypogammaglobulinemia, so a decrease in the amount of immunoglobulins produced by their blood cells. And because of that, they can be more susceptible to infection. And lastly, warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia is actually associated with CLL. So if you ever have a patient who's a little bit older, present them with a warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, remember those are IgG antibodies against the red blood cell, you're going to have to rule out CLL. Now the next type of leukemia we're going to discuss is called hairy cell leukemia. And hairy cell leukemia is a disease primarily of the elderly. And it's a mature B cell tumor that is interesting because it actually has these little tiny filament-like projections all around the cell cytoplasm. And they actually resemble hairs, and that's what we call it a hairy cell leukemia. The important thing you have to remember about this leukemia for step one is that if you stain it, it's TRAP positive. And TRAP is T-R-A-P, stands for tartrate-resistant acid phosphatase. These cells are TRAP positive. And the way I remember that is I think about I want to trap the hairy spider. If you had a hairy spider in your house, you'd want to trap it for sure. And hairy cell leukemia is trap positive, helps me to keep it all together. So trap the hairy spider. 
The other neoplasms we need to know about are the myeloid neoplasms. So the leukemias we discussed so far, ALL, CLL, and hairy cell leukemia are lymphoid neoplasms, meaning they come from the lymphocyte lineage in the bone marrow. There are two types of leukemia that come from the myeloid lineage in the bone marrow. These are AML, acute myelogenous leukemia, and CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. So discuss AML first. AML is usually found in middle-aged people, sometimes in the elderly, very rarely in children. Unlike ALL, which is predominantly a childhood tumor, AML can really present at any time in life. Now, classically, when you see these cells under the peripheral blood smear, you'll see something called hour rods. In a few minutes, we'll see what an hour rod looks like. But for now, just realize that these are small little rod-like inclusions that you'll see in the cytoplasm of the malignant cells in AML. And that's a clue to the diagnosis. Now, if you get a, a bone marrow biopsy in these patients, you're going to see a large number of myeloblasts, so immature cells of the myeloid lineage, and these are going to spread all throughout the bloodstream. And there is one important subtype of AML you should be familiar with on step one, and that is called the M3 variety, also known as acute promyelocytic leukemia. So M3 is the acute promyelocytic leukemia, APML, and that's so important to remember because it's actually responsive to vitamin A treatment, so all transretinoic acid. If you give all transretinoic acid, which is just vitamin A, to these patients, it can actually be curative for the leukemia. Now, the other type of leukemia from the myeloid lineage is CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And this is a really important one to know for several reasons. First of all, it's not really a true leukemia, and grouping it in leukemia is a sort of a misnomer. CML is more correctly placed as a myeloproliferative disorder, which we're going to talk about later in this lecture. But we group it in the name leukemia just because that's the name it was given a long time ago, so it's okay in your mind to keep AML and CML together. Just realize that what's going on is a little bit different. Now, CML being a myeloproliferative disorder is also interesting because it has a unique chromosomal translocation associated with it, that has turned out to be an excellent target for treatment. And this is called the Philadelphia chromosome, and it's actually a, a translocation between chromosomes 9 and 22. So the 922 translocation results in a new chromosome, which we call the Philadelphia chromosome. And the reason that this translocation causes a malignancy is that you have two proteins, one called BCR and one called ABL or ABL, coming together and fusing and creating a new fusion protein. And this bcr abel fusion protein is quite dangerous because what it results in is uncontrolled proliferation of these myeloid cells. So these patients are going to present with an increase in their white blood cell count, and predominantly it's going to be neutrophils, metamyelocytes, basophils, pretty much anything from the myeloid lineage. Now, one other really important thing to know about CML is that usually it's sort of an indolent course for a while, but then it can suddenly transform into what we call a blast crisis. So CML can actually transform into ALL or AML. So while it was a chronic leukemia for a while, it makes this different mutation and turns into an acute leukemia. You get a very, very rapid rise in the number of blast forms in the blood. This can be very rapidly progressing and cause death quite quickly. So you need to watch out for blast crisis in these patients and frequently monitor their white blood cell count. Now, the treatment I was talking about that's so important because of this translocation is called imatinib. And imatinib is a monoclonal antibody against the bcr abel fusion protein. So we've actually, in this case, been able to target the very protein that is causing uncontrolled cell proliferation. And patients with CML, who are Philadelphia chromosome positive, have a great cure rate treatment with imatinib. Now, before we move on to discuss the myeloproliferative disorders, we need to think about a few other miscellaneous topics regarding leukemia. The first of these is that I told you I'd show you a picture of hour rods. So let's take a look at your screen now. You can see what an hour rod looks like. Again, these are these peroxidase positive cytoplasmic inclusions that are shaped like a rod. You see them in the granulocytes that are present in acute myelocytic leukemia. They're even more commonly seen in the M3 variant, APML, or acute promyelocytic leukemia, the kind that we said is responsive to vitamin A. So this APML variety is also more common to see hour rods. Now, as we said, the treatment of this AML M3 variety is with vitamin A, and when you treat it, sometimes you're going to get destruction of the hour rods as the leukemic cells are being destroyed, and the hour rods will actually release their contents into the bloodstream. Some of their contents can actually cause DIC, 
which is disseminated intravascular coagulation. And we'll talk about DIC in a different lecture, but it's essentially a situation where you have an overactive clotting system, and all the clotting factors, including platelets, get used up, and the patient is likely to bleed. Now, another miscellaneous point regarding all these cancers we've discussed so far is that we really need to review the chromosomal translocations. We've talked about a lot between the lymphomas and the leukemias, and it's important now to take a moment to go over them all to make sure we have them straight in our head. So the first one is this chromosome 9 to 22 translocation, which causes the Philadelphia chromosome, the BCR able fusion protein, and chronic myelogenous leukemia. Next, we have the 814 translocation, which was seen in Burkitt's lymphoma. Again, this is causing activation of CMYK, which is an oncogene that should not be constitutionally active, and when it is, it causes uncontrolled cell proliferation. The 1418 translocation was that of follicular lymphoma, and the issue there was an overactive BCL2. And BCL2 was that protein that actually inhibits apoptosis, so too much of that again, causes uncontrolled cell proliferation. Translocation 15 to 17 was responsible for the M3 type of AML. Again, this is the kind that's responsive to all transretinoic acid and the kind where you're likely to see hour rods. Chromosomal translocation 11 to 22 is actually famous for the translocation of Ewing's sarcoma, which we have not talked about yet. This is a tumor of the musculoskeletal system and will be discussed in more detail during the musculoskeletal lecture. And lastly, we have a chromosomal translocation 1114. And 1114, as we discussed, the translocation for mantle cell lymphoma.